We doing okay today? This nice, muggy, humid morning in July. Aren't you happy to be alive? Y'all could be stuck off in a roadside ditch, just burning up right now. You could be in jail. You could be in the hospital, but you're not. You're right here, so we got something to be thankful for, don't we? That is true. So on that note, uh, so glad to be here today. Uh, as Pastor Austin said, my name's Landon. I'm on staff here at Beyond Church. Pastors Nate and Evan are on a little vacation this week. Uh, don't be jealous, but they're in Colorado where it's currently 65 degrees. I can tell how happy you are for them with those groans right there. Uh, it's cool, though. They're actually visiting their friends, uh, some folks who have been here before, Jeremy and Sarah Pearson at their church, uh, Legacy Church there in Colorado. So it's been a good time for them, and so just be believing that they're getting refreshed, and how can you not be refreshed when it's 65? All right, we won't dwell on that anymore. Oh, praise the Lord. Anyone hot in here right now? All right, we, it's, it's on. The air's on. It's working. You know how it is. It's working overtime right now, so hopefully it'll cool off in here. So you get me today. You get me today. Thank you for those three. Uh, we learned this from last time, didn't we? Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, but we're going to get the word today is what we're going to get. Um, it's going to be good. The, the thing that I love about teaching is that I don't have any pressure on me. Uh, you know what? It, uh, someone who, who does this, you know what? I need to study. I need to show myself approved, but I don't have to rely on me. Man, I've got the Holy Spirit who's, who is the teacher, okay? He's the teacher, and so I purpose just to yield myself to him, and he's going he's gonna to do the teaching today. So we're all going to learn something from the Bible in church. Does that sound good? Uh, I, know, I, I know that I usually, somehow, this always happens, uh, I don't know if it's just how pastor's schedule lines up, but I'm typically teaching on July 4th, and I know that because uh, there's a joke that always comes back to me every year around this time, and it has to do with buying fireworks. And so you're going to know that you ended up buying good fireworks when the guy at the fireworks stand gives you a high four on the way out, all right? <laughs> Y'all have heard that, right? So we tell it every year, so... I'll let the rest of you get that in a second. When you hear the laughs trickle through, then you'll know they just got it, all right? Oh, come on. Y'all need to lighten up. It's all right to laugh in church. Y'all want a little update? If you haven't been here before, um, uh, the last few times I've got to talk, I've, I've given an update. I got a Chuck Norris desk calendar. Everyone's excited to hear what Chuck Norris has been up to on my desk. Man, that almost sounds like that's why y'all came to church. Y'all need to reel, reel it in just a little bit. But Chuck Norris has been doing some stuff. Um, uh, during Frontline, I shared a few of them this last, I think, a week and a half ago or so. But uh, one of the reasons one said that Chuck Norris can make memory foam forget. <laughs> the one this morning actually said the police once pulled over Chuck Norris. Being a man who respects the law, Chuck Norris let them go with a warning. <laughs> Pre appreciate that, Chuck. Chuck Norris doesn't bowl strikes. He just knocks down one pin and the other nine faint. And uh, for all of you beachgoers this summer, when Chuck Norris goes to the beach, the sun puts on Chuck Block. So just remember that. <laughs> oh, what a guy. He's a man, isn't he? Chuck Norris. The, the, these pictures on the desk, there's pictures of Chuck Norris, and he's shirtless, you know, he's like on his bow flex. You remember all the commercials? You forget, Chuck Norris was a dude. Like, he's ripped. No, y'all don't remember. I mean, I guess some of you don't remember. Has anyone seen Walker, Texas Ranger? Come on. Okay. He's a guy. He's a guy. But uh, I love this because what we're going to do today, we are going to wrap up the whole family series that we've been on for the last 12 weeks. Um, it's been a really good 12 weeks, hasn't it? Sorry, I'm going to get this straight. It's been a last uh, uh, 12 weeks. has been really good talking about whole family. How many of you want a whole family? Uh, not to breeze past that, but having a whole family means one thing. That word whole, it means complete. It means we're not lacking anything. It means there's peace. There's joy. There's things in my family where it's whole. Like if you're thinking about a pie, the whole pie is there and nothing's missing. And this is what God wants for our families. He's the one who designed the family, who instituted family, right? And he wants your family to be whole in every way. So some of us, our families all look a little different. Um, you were born into a family, you've acquired family, uh, you've married into family, and so everyone has different sets of family, but God's will for your life is that your family would be whole and complete. And that's a promise to you. This is a promise from God to you that your family can be whole, even if you don't like them. God wants, God wants you to like them. And you can. 
Some people think that there are uh, just differences that can't be reconciled, and I'll never see eye to eye with this family member. Family member. That is not God's will. That is not God's best, and that can change. It's subject to change. It's something that's temporal here on this earth, right? God's way of doing things is he wants things whole. He wants things not just patched up, but he wants them restored and better than ever. And he can do it. And he can do it. So we started the very first week, if you remember, Pastor Nate taught a message, uh, actually him and Pastor Evan, and it was called um, A Family Full of Faith in a World Full of Fear. That was the, the first message in this series, and so we're going to wrap up today uh, with the title of this message being A Faithful Family, A Faithful Family, and we're going to talk about what this word faithful means today. Um, here's, here's what you can do, though. If you show me a faithful family, I'll show you a family who's having an impact. A faithful family is an impactful family. They are, they are doing something in their lives that is reaching more than just them that is doing something more for just them. That's what a faith, faithful family is going to be. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, let's look at this opening verse. It says, many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful person who can find. A faithful person who can find. So this is one of those things. You can't, not just anyone is faithful. I said, not just anyone is faithful. Who can find a faithful person, the Bible says? Who can find this person? And one of, the, one of the most, of all the qualities of God, the most amazing qualities of God, faithfulness may, may be one of my favorites. God is so faithful. And you know, just like it was because God first loved me, now I can love him, it's the same way. Because God was first faithful to me, I can now be faithful to him. And I think we we probably have our own defin, definitions of what faithful means, but we're going to dig into the Word and let the Word define it for us this morning, what faithful means. But I want to be a faithful person that the Lord finds. And by the end of this message, I hope, I hope that you do too, a faithful person who can find. Um, before we get started, I actually want to, uh, we've been going over some testimonies the last few weeks. And these testimonies keep coming in. How many of you are being blessed by these? The awesome thing about testimonies is, is it is how you overcome. We overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So we need to talk about what God's doing in our lives. And people are, and they're sending stuff in. And I want to encourage you to send stuff in. Hey, Ian, we've got, a, we've got a graphic, too, for testimonies, if you can put up, where it says share your testimony. You can actually scan the QR code on this graphic here in a second, and it'll give you a way to submit that. But... I want to read two testimonies to you real quick. Um, these are so good. So this one says, For the longest time I've been struggling with forgiving my abuser. I've struggled so much on even the thought of forgiving this man. I just feasibly could not see myself forgive someone who messed up my childhood and gave me this trauma to carry around or what I thought I had to carry around. So on Sunday, the 23rd, so that was last Sunday, Pastor Nate started talking about forgiveness. I felt the Lord moving in my heart, but I still couldn't grasp the thought of forgiving my abuser. On Wednesday, this previous Wednesday, which was the night of prayer that we had, um, is when it all happened for me. As we were praying, I really felt God. I felt God to the point where I felt him standing right next to me, hugging me, telling me, it's okay, my child. I've forgiven your abuser, and you've been carrying this long enough. It's time to lay it in my hands and forgive him the way I have forgiven him. At this moment, my, my eyes began to fill with tears, and all I could say was, thank you, Lord. Thank you for carrying this burden for me so I don't have to carry it. Thank you for showing me it's okay to forgive this man the way you have forgiven him. I've been working towards this moment for so long, and the amount of relief I felt fall off my shoulders is indescribable. I feel like I can't even grasp the way I feel right now other than God is a mighty God, and knowing I no longer have to live with the regret of opening my mouth and saying something and putting this man behind bars is just an indescribable, amazing feeling. Please feel free to share this on Sunday. I hope it will reach someone who needs to hear it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And I'll be honest, I'll be honest, it, it, maybe it wasn't to this extent, but I was in this service on Wednesday night. I was upstairs, and I was repenting of some things. Forgiveness is a powerful thing. Did you, did you know that this person forgave this man in her heart? Not that, that person wasn't around, but she forgave this person and was released of all that stuff that she had been carrying. Forgiveness is what, unforgiveness is what keeps us behind bars, basically. When I choose to live in unforgiveness, I'm just locked in this cell 
and I'm not free. And when I choose to forgive the way God has, and I'll tell you what, it's God and God alone who can give you the power and the grace to forgive someone. Why? Because he first did it for me. Man, that's so good, isn't it? Thank you, Lord. So I know that that ministered to somebody. All right, and then this, this other one. God, this is so good, too, all of these. So someone going to go into our church. Our son, who is currently in jail after a bad decision, was telling us about a new inmate named Mike that he knew before jail. He said, I need to talk to him because I had a dream about him last night that he died. And we said, yes, you do need to talk to him. So he called us tonight and shared that he did talk to Mike, and he shared the dream he had with him. He told him his own testimony and then led Mike in the salvation prayer (laughs) in jail. People getting saved in jail right now. He said Mike looked at him with the biggest tears in his eyes and gave him a big hug. He'll be joining our son's Bible study in the jail. And then speaking of the Bible study, they are outgrowing the cell they meet in, up to eight in the study, and more guys are getting curious. And he said they have favor with many of the guards. Before saying our good, uh, goodbye, our son said, God, it's who he is, it's what he does, and how he works. you got to be all in. I'm done running from God. I'm running to God. We know that our God is faithful and has heard our prayers, but we are still blown away. Our son wants you all to know that prayers are being answered and God is moving there. Thank you, Lord. Man. Golly. Man, I'm not crying. You're crying. Man, God's goodness. He loves people so much. And he'll do anything to get to people, to get through to somebody. And he's using people. And God's doing this and can do this in your life too. Let us know what's going on. You can pull that down. Thank you. Let us know what's going on. We want to keep sharing these. You know why? Because just as these encourage you, yours is going to encourage someone else. So you can't hold on to it. You got, you've got to tell it. You've got to tell it. All right, let's talk about faithfulness this morning. Are you ready? Well, I thought I was, but everything disappeared. Um, let me find it here. All right, so. We're going to talk about what faithfulness looks like, okay? And we're going to define it from the Word. And we're going to read a a pretty big portion of Scripture here in 1 Samuel chapter 2. And so if you have your Bibles and you want to read along, go ahead and pull those out or you can follow along on the screens. But we're going to be going through a pretty good portion of Scripture here, okay? So you got to stay plugged in. you got to listen. If you listen good, I can read fast, okay? All right. Are you all ready? All right, so this is talking about um, Eli. In fact, I feel like we talked about this not too long ago. Here, this is talking about Eli, who is the priest, who is God's priest at the time. And this is a story about his sons and when Samuel comes on the scene, okay? So in verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels. We don't use that term any much more, do we? Scoundrels. Sounds like a word from Robin Hood. Scoundrels, who had no respect for the, for the Lord or for their duties as priests. So his sons were priests under Eli. He was the main, he was the head priest there at the temple, but his sons were priests there as well. Whenever anyone offered a sacrifice, Eli's sons would send over a servant with a three-pronged fork uh, while the meat of the sacrificed animal, oh, those animals surrendered themselves. (laughs) I'll never pray for my food the same again. I'll also have to thank the Lord for all the surrendered animals. Oh, because that is the best kind of food, a surrendered animal. On my plate, amen. All right, so Eli's sons were going over with the, with the three-pronged fork, or they sent people over to do this, and while the meat of the sacrificed animal was still boiling, the servant would stick the fork into the pot. So what's happening right now is people are coming to the temple, and they're, sac- they're, they're making a sacrifice to God. They're, they're making a sacrificial offering to the Lord, and there's ways that you have to make this offering, Right? The law, the law at the time is telling them you, should, you have to do this and you have to do this. Well, while they're in the middle of this ceremony of sacrificing this animal, Eli's boys are sending people over to basically grab that before they're done with the ceremony, what they're supposed to do and how they're offering it, okay? So they're, they're taking the offering, and the servant would stick the fork into the pot and demand that whatever uh, be, is brought up is given to Eli's sons. All the Israelites who came to worship at Shiloh were treated this way. Sometimes the servant would come even before the animal's fat had been burned on the altar. He would demand raw meat before it had been boiled so that it could be used for roasting. 
the man, offer the, the man offering the sacrifice might reply, take as much as you want, but the fat must be burned first. Then the servant would demand, no, give it to me now or I'll take it by force. So the sin of these young men was very serious in the Lord's sight, for they treated the Lord's offerings with contempt. So there's, this is some bad stuff going on right here. I mean, think about this today when we bring our offerings to the Lord. It'd be like if we had the buckets up on stage and we were coming up and we were bringing an offering to the Lord and I reached down and I just grabbed a handful out of your hand before you even put it in the bucket. This is what we're talking about here. This is robbing. It's robbing from people and it's robbing from God. Like what are these guys do? What do they think they're doing right now? This is crazy what's going on. And the sad part is that's not all that they were doing. Let's go on here in uh, verse 18. Starts talking about Samuel. So if you know, uh, Hannah is Samuel's mom, and she couldn't have kids. Uh, she came to the temple. Long story short, she ended up having Samuel. She said, if I have a child, I'm going to dedicate him to the Lord. Well, she did. God promised her a child. Samuel was born, and after he was weaned, she brought him to the temple to grow up and to live and to serve the Lord. So Samuel's a young boy. It says, uh, but Samuel, verse 18, though he was only a boy, served the Lord. Somebody say, served the Lord. He wore a linen garment like that of a priest. Each year his mother made a small coat for him and brought it to him when she came with her husband for the sacrifice. Before they returned home, Eli would bless Elkanah, who was Hannah's wife, and Hannah and say, May the Lord give you other children to take the place of this one that she gave to the Lord. And the Lord blessed Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Okay, so interesting, it goes to talk about Eli. So we're, we're, we're looking at Eli's sons who were young men, okay, and we see what they're doing, and then it goes to Samuel, who is a boy, and it's saying that Samuel served the Lord, even as a boy, okay? Now let's keep going in verse 22. It says, now Eli was very old, but he was aware of what his sons were doing to the people of Israel. He knew, for instance, that his sons were seducing the young women who assisted at the entrance of the tabernacle. And so this gets worse. They're, they're stealing from people, the people of God, and they're stealing from God, and now they're seducing and sleeping with the women who are working in the temple. Like, this is, you talk about a scandal. I mean, it's all just right here. The people know what's going on. Their own father, who is over them, not only as a father, but as the head priest, knows what's going on. Eli said to them, I've been hearing reports from all the people about the wicked things you're doing. Why do you keep sinning? You must stop, my sons. The reports I hear among the Lord's people are not good. If someone sins against another person, God can uh, mediate for the guilty party. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede? But Eli's sons wouldn't listen to their father, and the Lord was already planning to put them to death. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with the people. And so we see this stark contrast right here between Eli's sons and between Samuel, don't we? And this is going to get to the heart of what we're talking about when we're talking about faithfulness this morning. And so Eli's sons, doing all these things they were doing, and their father told them this, but we see, if you go on and read, I don't think we're going to, if you go on and read, like, they don't stop. They do not stop. And what ends up, actually, I think we are going to end up reading, are we? Uh, yeah, we got verse 27. But I want, I want to, we're going to go back to this point here in a second. In verse 26, where it says, But Samuel, he grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord and with the people. Can you grow in favor with God? Yes. You can actually grow in favor with God. So if I know that I can grow in favor with God, my next question is, How? How? Because I want that. I want to grow in favor with God Almighty, the God of the universe. And that's what we're going to get to a little bit today. Well, let's keep reading and finish this story. Verse 27. One day a man of God came to Eli and gave him this message from the Lord. I revealed myself to your ancestors when they were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. I chose your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer sacrifices on my altar, to burn incense, and to wear the priestly vest as you serve me. And I assigned the sacrificial offerings to your priests. So why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give me? For you and they have become fat from the best offerings of my people Israel. Verse 30, therefore the Lord, the God of Israel says, I promise that your branch of the tribe of Levi would always be my priest, but I will honor those who honor me 
and I will despise those who think lightly of me. We've heard this scripture around here, haven't we? God will honor those who honor him, and he will despise those who think lightly of him, who esteem him lightly. So we see that's exactly what's going on. You know that this is also going on in Eli, Eli's life? Well, he, he's not the one sinning against God. Yes, he is. He is allowing this to go on in the place that God has placed him over. This is why God's talking to him, not his sons. God's talking to the leader here. He's talking to him, and he said, and he said because of this, where are we at here? Verse 30. Verse 30. Therefore, um, verse 31. It says, the time is coming near, or the time is coming when I will put an end to your family, so it will no longer serve as my priests. All the members of your family will die before their time. None will reach old age. You will watch with envy as I pour out prosperity on the people of Israel, but no members of your family will ever live out their days. The few not cut off from serving at my altar will survive, but only so their eyes can go blind and their hearts break, and their children will die a violent death. Man, this is tough stuff right here. This is tough stuff. Um, Verse 34, And to prove that what I have said will come true, I will cause your two sons, uh, Hophni, and Phinehas to die on the same day. Boy, these guys, these kids had a rough get-go from the start there. Hophni, I mean, I don't even know how you say that. Hophni and Phinehas. Eli didn't give them a very good start there. That's, that's a tough break for them. Um, verse 35, verse 35. God says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. Someone say Faithful who will do according to what is in my heart and my mind. And I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. So this is a good definition of faithful to me right here. God said, this is God talking, I'm going to raise up a faithful priest. Here's what a faithful priest looks like. They will do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. So faithfulness starts with me doing what is in God's heart, with what God has said. So we see very clearly that this wasn't happening in Eli's tenure here. What, what God wanted and what God said, not happening. God's saying, I'm going to raise up a faithful priest who will do what is in my heart and in my mind. This is what a faithful man or woman looks like. Do I serve the Lord? Do I serve the Lord by doing what he says, how he says to do it, when he says to do it, when he says to do it. And, you know, sometimes I, I think if you, depending on how much you've been around the Bible and reading this, sometimes you'll read about, you'll hear the God of the Old Testament. God of the Old Testament is God of the New Testament. He is God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you might think that this language that he's talking about here is harsh, but this language isn't harsh. This, harsh. this language is called just. God is a just God. And he does not condone sin. He can't even, he cannot condone sin. It, it is, it is the, it's anti who he is. He can't do it. I am just so thankful. The only difference is that Jesus came and paid a price for you and I. That when we place our faith in him, God now looks at us through the blood of Jesus. Thank, aren't you thankful? We were do this same, we've done some of this same type of stuff. Maybe not to that degree, but then we get into measuring this sin and that sin, and sin is sin. And if you if you'd sin in the little, guess what? It's the same as the big. It's all the same. But God. But God, who loved us so much, and He's so rich in mercy that He sent Jesus for us. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. Otherwise, we would end up with this same type of end. Amen. So I want to focus real quick before we move on. I want to focus on this part about how we can grow in favor with God. I'm interested in this. Okay, I'm interested in how I can. So uh, faithfulness equals increased favor. And I want to look at a few examples here. We, we saw that that happened there um, with Samuel. Samuel was serving in the house of the Lord, and he was doing it the right way. And the Bible says that he grew in favor with God, and he also grew in favor with people. You can grow in favor with people in your life. You can, you can grow in favor with people that you don't even know yet. How? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Let's look in Daniel chapter 6. We're going to look at a few 
other uh, men from the Bible here. Uh, Daniel 6, chapters 1 through 4. So, you know, Daniel, this is there in Babylonian captivity. And it says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one. So they've got all these 120, I guess that word is satraps. I should have looked, I don't know, just whatever that means. And then there's three governors over these 120, and Daniel's one of the governors, okay, uh, that the satraps may give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps, the other ones, they uh, sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. And so the favor of God is inseparable from faithfulness, okay? So we see that Daniel found favor here, and the other people that he was serving alongside who were under him, and he was serving alongside, because of his faithfulness, he found favor with the king, and the king wanted to exalt him and promote him even more, and they didn't like that, and they tried to sabotage him, but they couldn't because they found no fault with him. That doesn't mean he was perfect. That doesn't mean he was perfect. We're talking about faithfulness here. Faithfulness. Daniel was found faithful. I want to look, um, you, you may know this story well, I want to look at Joseph too. Let's look in Genesis chapter 39, 1 through 4. We're going to get some Bible reading in today, okay? It's good for us. 39, 1 through 4. You know, when we're singing about looking full in his glorious face, you know what the face of Jesus looks like? It looks like when you open up your Bible and you look right into it. That's looking into the face of Jesus. He was the Word made flesh. He's the Word. Man, sometimes we can get tripped up thinking, man, what does Jesus look like? He looks like what my Bible looks like. That's Him. He is the Word made flesh, and He dwelt among us. Genesis 39, 1 through 4, it says, uh, this is after uh, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. They sold him to be a slave. He'd been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Someone say this with me. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. That was repeated, but that's good enough. Okay. <laughs> the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. So his master actually saw that the Lord was with him. There was something that he could see on Joseph that indicated the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house and all that he had put under his authority. I mean, this is very key right here. Joseph... Joseph knew that the Lord was with him. Joseph knew that. And yet, Joseph got thrown in a pit by his brothers, sold into a slavery, and this guy says, hey, I'm going to buy you, and you're going to become my slave. And Joseph knew the Lord was with him. And what does the Bible say? He served his master. He served him. This is going to be very key for what we talk about today. He served him. Um. Let's see here. And we're not going to go on and read the rest of Genesis here, but you know what happens after this if you know the story of Joseph. Potiphar's wife got her eyes on Joseph, and she wanted Joseph, and she trapped Joseph. And what happened is Joseph said, I'm not doing anything with you. You're the only one in this, my master's house who, I, who he did not give me to manage, essentially. You're it. And I'm not going to do that to him or to God. And, she, and so she kept coming on to him. He took off running, and she ripped his clothes off. And so he's running out naked, and, you know, she turns it against him. And, says, and Potiphar comes back and believes his wife, and Joseph gets thrown in jail. And so it, it seems like, man, Joseph thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, becomes a slave. Things are going well. Now he gets lied on, and now he's in prison. He's in prison. What does it say happens when he's in prison? 
it says that he grows in favor with the guard of the prison. In prison. And the it's, Bible says again that the Lord was with him and he caused all that he, all that he did to succeed. In prison. In prison. And if you know what happens next, uh, Joseph ends up basically getting called up and he becomes second in command to only Pharaoh in all of Egypt. Basically over everything. Everything. And it's not a surprise based on how Joseph, what he did at each step along the way. You know he had an opportunity every single time to say, are you kidding me? God, you gave me this dream. You gave me this dream and look what's happened here. But he recognized every time that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him and caused him to succeed in all that he did everywhere he went. So this is a key component of faithfulness right here. The Lord was with him. How could he be faithful in all of those situations? The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Favor increases as I continue to be faithful. He continued in each spot to be faithful. I know, guys, this may not be the most sexy message to hear, but this is a life-changing message right here for you. This is a life change. This will change your life, your station in life right now. You want to know how to get from where where you're at to where you feel the Lord has called you? Faithfulness is the only way. It's the only way. You will never, ever get to where you believe God's called you to go, whether that's on your job, wherever that is, except and apart from faithfulness. That's it. And we're going to read some scriptures that, that say that pretty clear, but I, I, would, I would encourage you, man, tune in to what we're talking about right here. We need to glean something from what the Word says about these things right here. Yeah. Favor in my life will increase as I continue to be faithful. So, well, the, the Bible, well, how, how, did, how did this happen with Joseph? The Bible says that the Lord was with him. This is amazing, too. In the Old Testament, before Jesus had come, what's amazing about us, once you give your life to Jesus... Once you make Jesus the Lord of your life, the Bible says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead now lives on the inside of you. So since you have the same spirit that Jesus had when he walked the earth, you are now able to do the same things that Jesus did. A lot of people think that's blasphemous, but I'm talking about what the, I didn't even go as far as what the word says. The Bible says that these works, Jesus told his disciples this, the works that you see me do, these works and greater will you do because I'm going to the Father and I'm sending the Holy Spirit who is the same one empowering me to live the way I lived. You have the same spirit that lived in Jesus when he walked the earth. So guess what? The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. So you have now the ability to be faithful. In Galatians 5.22, we hear about what the fruits of the Spirit are. The fruits of the Spirit are joy, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Faithfulness is a part of your recreated spirit. It's a fruit of your spirit. It's not something that you have to work up and conjure up. It's something that's on the inside of you. So when you rely on the Spirit of God living on the inside of you, you're able to live faithfully. So it's not something that I have to figure out how to do. It's I have to yield to it on the inside of me, okay? Okay. And that, that may be different languages. So I've got to yield. Well, listen, if there's something that's already in me, then it's supposed to be worked out. And so it's just a matter of my will now. Will I yield to what's in my spirit or will I yield to my flesh and just what I want and how I feel and what I think and what I see? What am I going to yield to? It's super, super easy. We've all done this and you may be doing it right now and you may have done it lately. I, I have too. Yielded to my flesh in some way. I heard something. I saw something. I felt something. Someone looked at me the wrong way. And it changed, it changed what I thought. And it changed what I did as a result. But just like we can do that, I can yield to what's already on the inside of me. Faithfulness. And I can yield to that and I can walk in that. And that can be walked out of my life just like anything else can. What am I yielding to? What am I allowing to speak into my life? Are y'all with me? I don't have to work to to attain these fruits, but I must choose to yield to them. You got to choose. 
You know, there's a couple of other examples of just how um, men grew in favor with God. I mean, I remember the story, you may remember the story of David. Uh, God anointed David to be king of Israel, right? Well, at the time, Saul was king. And so just because David was anointed to be king of Israel didn't mean that his time was right then. And, you know, long story short, David ends up you know, playing for Saul, and Saul's being tormented by these evil spirits. David's playing for him, and the evil spirits go away. Uh, Saul grows to love David. Then he finds out that, you know, the, David is going to end up being king, whatever. He gets jealous. He ends up trying to kill David multiple times. Multiple times Saul tries to kill David. And David always kind of, David was always, he, he had a few different times where he could have killed Saul and called it self-defense. This guy is trying to kill me, and he was in a place where he could have killed Saul, and no one would have even known, and he didn't do it, and the people around David were wanting him to do it. This guy's trying to kill you, and he said, I'm not going to put my hand on the Lord's anointed. Like, how dare you even think that I'm to touch the Lord's anointed? And he, they cut a piece of, of Saul's robe off and showed it to Saul and basically said, I could have killed you, but I didn't. You're king right now, you're king right now, and I honor you and I respect you. And he was, that's what faithfulness is, faithful. David was faithful, and he grew. You can tell that David grew in favor with God, and he grew in favor with people. All of Israel, he grew in favor with them. Why? Because he acted on his impulse and his instincts, and he killed the man who was trying to kill him? No, because he was faithful to God by not putting his hand on the Lord's anointed. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. Luke chapter 2, 51 and 52. This is talking about Jesus when he was a younger boy. It says, he returned to Nazareth with his parents, and he was obedient to them. Someone say obedient. And his mother stored all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Man, so we see Jesus even growing up. He is growing up, and he's somehow growing in favor with God. Like, like, like you're, you're, his, you're his son. How are you growing in favor with him? Jesus grew in favor with God. That's what the Bible says. And it says he grew in favor with people. How did he do this? Well, there's one insight here. He went back to where his parents were, and even though that he was uh, the Word made flesh, he was God in the flesh, he was obedient to his earthly parents. This goes back to a message that we talked about on Father's Day. Pastor Nate talked about honoring your father and mother. Amen. God couldn't be God if he didn't do what he said. Jesus honored his father and mother, and he was obedient to them. You know what that's called? faithfulness, obedience, obedience, honoring those who God has placed over you, faithfulness. And he grew in favor with God and people. This is very important right here. He was, you know how Jesus was faithful to God? Because he was faithful to his parents. See, sometimes we think that we can be faithful to God without being faithful to people, and we're lying to ourselves. That's impossible to do. You can't be faithful to God if you're not faithful to the people that he's placed in your life and placed over you. If I'm not faithful to people, then I am not faithful to God. You know, it's easy to be faithful with the things that you value, with the people that you value. Um, if I'm struggling to be faithful with a certain person in my life, and sometimes we just think like, in a marriage or something, oh, he was unfaithful. That's not, that's not all that we're talking about right here. But even in a situation like that, the reason that something like that happens is because they lose value and they don't place as much value and honor on the person that God brought into their lives. And in a moment, a decision is made where they get a chance to be unfaithful, right? But faithfulness, faithfulness is more than just that right there. If I value the, the people that God has placed in my life, it'll be much easier for me to be faithful to them. And again, if I can't be faithful to them, I'm not being faithful to God. So that, that's key. That is very key for us. Are y'all with me? All right, so I want to, and this is something I went over in Frontline a little bit. This is something that a few years back that we had talked about on one of our staff retreats. 
um, just hearing a message on faithfulness, and it was amazing, and I just went back through some of my notes, and I wanted to go over this again. In Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 12, um, I want to talk about what we're to be faithful with. So we're talking about how faithfulness is key. Faithfulness is key for promotion in my life. Faithfulness is key for me to grow in favor with God and with people. Well, how do I do that? Like, how can I be faithful? How, you know, how can I walk this out in my life? We're going to look at it right here. Luke 16, verse 10, it says, If you are faithful in little things, someone say little things, then you will be faithful in the large ones. So we can just stop right there. You, you, know, you know people like to think that once they get to a certain station in life, once they have a certain amount in their bank account, then they're going to do something different. We know that that's a lie, right? What we do with what we have right now is the same thing that we would do if what we have was increase and amplified. So I'll, I'll never be someone different than I am right now if the things around me in my life change. Whatever I do with little is the same thing that I would do with much. This is why, okay, I'm, I'll get ahead of myself here. Let's just chill out a little bit. Go back to verse 10. But it says, if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? So this is a this is a good good passage of scripture right here. So how many of you would say, I believe what this scripture says right here? If I'm not faithful in the least, I can't I can't be given much, right? And so I don't think that anyone would necessarily disagree with what this is saying. But in practice, many of us do. So how I actually live my life will determine whether I believe that this scripture is true or not. Right? So, and this is what I talked about a little in front line. This, front line. this is where the rubber meets the road. Like, it's going to come down to what I actually do with this verse that tells me if I believe it or not. It's not just me saying, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, I I can see that, and then not live by it. So if I believe what it says, it will reflect in how I actually live my life. This isn't too hard for y'all, is it? It's the word. This is good. This is good for us. So um, I want to go through the few things that it talks about here. It talks about if I'm faithful in the little things. It talks about being faithful with like worldly wealth, with money, little things, money. And then it talks about being faithful with other people's things. So I want to talk about those three things, being faithful in the little things. And so there's just little things in life that sometimes we'll just kind of brush to the side and maybe not think that much about. And what that will cause us to do is to be unfaithful with that. So one of the things, one of the examples I like to think about is just like the, the, the things that God's blessed me with. You know, you might think about like my lawnmower is a little thing. It's actually a big thing. It's a big, big mower. I really like it a lot. But that's just a, that's a little thing. And so how I relate to, this, is, this may sound crazy to you, but don't let it. How I relate to and how I talk about my lawnmower is a little thing, Right? If I can't be faithful with how I relate to that, I can't be entrusted with the tractor that's next. Okay? So if I think that this lawnmower is always messing up and I get off and it didn't start and I kick the tire and hurt my foot in the process and I'm mad and I'm talking about this piece of junk and it doesn't work, this is what you call unfaithful. This is unfaithful. I'm being unfaithful with how I relate to, talk to, and treat something that God has blessed me with. And what I'm doing is I'm undermining my faith for something better. You know, God's not against you having things. God wants you to have nice things. He, he wants you to have nice things. You know what? He's a good father. It says he's given us all things rich, richly to enjoy. He has. But he would be a bad father if he gave me the nice things when I don't treat the little things the right way. You don't do this to your kids, do you? Oh, you know what? I know, I know you didn't, you know, that, I don't know, what, what's a little gaming system? I don't know, like a Switch or something? I don't, those are like $400. How little is that? What's the next big thing? Anybody? 
y'all are really helpful this morning, I swear. I mean, this is great. This is great. Anybody, young kids, what is like a gaming console that's expensive and nice? PlayStation, Xbox, I played those. Is that still what's happening today? I'm not as old as y'all thought I was. Huh? Oh, I had a two there on five now. Okay, that makes more sense. But if I can't treat, let me go back, let me give you a little 90s reference. If I can't treat my little Game Boy the right way, and I throw it across the room, and I don't take care of the games, and it doesn't work anymore, why would my parents think that I'm able to handle something much more expensive than that? If they're good parents, they wouldn't. I said they wouldn't. That's called enabling. That's called enabling and reinforcing a behavior that is not going to produce any good fruit in your life at all. <laughs> Y'all want to, let's dip into a little parenting talk this morning. <laughs> Come on, this is not how God, like, I've got, I've got God's blueprint right here. So the way that he's fathering me is the way that I'm to be fathering my children. And if they can't be trusted with the little things, then they're not, they are not qualified for the bigger things. They're not qualified for the bigger things. And so it matters how I treat the little things in my life. And I tell you what, there are things in your life that you perceive as little. There's little, there's just that. I don't give it as much attention. I don't give it as much time. I don't give it as much honor. But you know the easiest way to, to treat uh, to be faithful with a little thing is to make a big deal about it. And it may, again, it may sound, boy, that air's on now. Do y'all feel that? That feels good. That feels like the anointing up here, actually. <laughs> that feels really good. Usually I'm on the front row shivering, but I feel it this morning. I like that. Um, and now I don't know where I was, what I was talking about. Yeah, but making a big deal about it. So again, if talking to your things sounds crazy to you, then maybe you just need to get a little crazier, okay? Because actually you already are crazy. You know why? Because you're talking to your stuff. <laughs> you are talking to the stuff in your life. You're talking to the stuff in your house, in your garage. It just depends what you're saying about those things. Am I being a faithful steward of what God's put in my hand right now? Can he trust me with this little thing? It's going to prove if I'm ready for the big thing. All right, let's move on to the money things. Aren't you glad you stuck around for this? Let's talk about the money things. I mean, and really, it, it goes along with just what we're talking about here. If I can't be honest with a few dollars, then why in the world would God entrust me to handle something as valuable as, like, spiritual gifts? The, the money is what God calls the very least. So even below the little things, here is money. It's the very least, and the problem is that in the world, the world puts it up here. And so we're already kind of in this battle where we have to decide how we're going to relate to money. And to get ahead of ourselves a little bit, um, if you go down just a few scriptures in verse 13, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so Pastor Nate even talked about this a few weeks ago, where what happens is, is money so often is telling us what to do, which means whoever tells you what to do is lording over you and is your Lord. So Jesus is to be our Lord, and we're to get our directions from him. So he may tell us something to do that we don't have the money for right now. So am I going to allow him to tell me what to do or money to tell me what to do? So sometimes we'll just look and say, well, Jesus, I can't do that right now because of this. And our decisions made now, we've made money our Lord because it's now telling us what to do. And so if money is lording over me, Jesus isn't. But if Jesus is lording over me, then I'm lording over my money. And this is a place for us where while we, while we talk a lot about tithing and giving around here, because it's a way that the word that the Bible has given us, God said, bring all the tithe into the storehouse so there would be meat in my house. And this is what was happening back then. They were bringing their offerings to the temple so there would be meat in their house. What was happening is Eli, Eli's sons were taking the meat before it was ready. That meat was meant to be a blessing to them as the priests, 
in God's house, but they were taking all of it before it was ready and consuming it all themselves, and that's wrong. But giving and generosity is the best way, is the best way for money not to lord over you because you're living with an open hand, you're generous to people, you're generous to God, you're generous when he tells you to be generous, and it's not dictating everything that you do. Guys, we have to be faithful with the dollar. I will never have true riches in my life. You might ask, well, what are, what are true riches? If you go back to verse 10 or 11 or whatever, where it's talking about worldly wealth, what are true riches? God knows what true riches are in your life more than you do right now. You might think that true riches for me is this, this, and this, but really God knows more than you what true riches look like in your life. He does. And the awesome thing about God is he wants those true riches in your life more than you even do. He knows what a blessing it would be to you. Amen? So we have to learn how to handle the dollar. If I can't, I mean, it's the same thing, same example we just have with our kids. This is what we're teaching our kids right now. You know, if you have an allowance or if you do something and you earn some money and you get something, I'm watching how you're handling that money. And in fact, what I'm doing right now is I'm saying, you just made $10. Tell me what the tithe is of that $10. So we're to get to do a little math lesson too. And they get to learn how to, what 10% means and how to divide and all that stuff. Because I'm, I'm telling my kids and I'm training my kids, you are not to take all that $10 or you'll be stealing. 10% of that is the Lord's. This is what the Bible says. And you're to set that aside for the Lord. And before you spend any of that, you better make sure that that gets to the Lord. And you're free to give any of the extra that you want as well. Right? We need to be teaching our kids this. We need to teach ourselves this. This is what God says. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. That's 10%. The first 10%. The first fruits. The Bible talks about this very clearly. And when I do that, guess what? God's blessing is on the rest of what I have. And I'd much rather have God's blessing on 90% or 80% of whatever I have than God not involved in my money at all. At all. Because it's just going to get eaten up by everything that this world can use to eat it up. I've got to be faithful with the dollar. I must so that I can, I can uh, experience true riches. Thirdly, and finally in this verse, it says, if you're not faithful, verse 12, with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? So, this is good. This is good for us right here. If I can't be faithful with other people's things, I won't be trusted with things of my own. God allows me and gives me an opportunity to serve someone else's vision before he gives me vision of my own for my own life. I'm not capable to just have a vision or whatever God, whatever you, God's just going to give me a vision out of nowhere, and I'm going to do it without ever following someone else's vision and seeing what that looks like. That will not happen. It can't happen. You don't just walk into a company that's a Fortune 500 company and become CEO. That's not how that works. You come in, entry level, and guess what? If you're faithful, you get promoted, and you get promoted and I'm not just talking about if you're, if you're faithful there. I'm talking about if you're faithful to God, if you're faithful to your boss, to your coworkers, and they can't find any fault with you. Why? Because you're faithful. You're faithful. Faithfulness is what will bring favor in your life that will cause promotion to come. Promotion is not about climbing a corporate ladder and stepping on people as you get there. That is not true promotion. You're, you are bound to fall if that's how you do it. And it won't happen that way. It could, but it ain't going to last. It can't last that way. It's built on biblically right here. If I can't be trusted to do what my boss has asked me to do, I will never get to be the one calling the shots in anything that will ever be successful. Guys, this is how we can build our lives right here, yeah. faithfulness. The awesome news is I don't care whether you're 18, whether you're 68, you have an opportunity to serve someone else and to be faithful 
under them right now. I'm telling you. And God is the one who brings true promotion in every area of your life. This is why, man, part of my testimony is, is, yeah, I grew up in the local church here, but part of my testimony is that at a, at a crucial stage in my life, I planted myself by my own decision in the local church. As, as a 19, 20, 21-year-old, going to college, young married, I planted myself in the house of God, and I learned about some of these things, and I learned how to serve a pastor's vision that wasn't my vision. God didn't give it to me. This is where I learned how to serve someone else. This is where I learned how to give of myself and to do and to do something that I didn't come up with on my own, to serve somebody else. The local church is the breeding ground for promotion in every area of your life. I'm convinced of this. And I know that there are people who aren't planted in a local church who are out in careers and they're getting promoted, but I'm telling you, if you see the fruit in their lives, and we, if you see the fruit in their lives, it's not what you would want. There is a way to be promoted the right way and for it to bring the blessing and the fruit in your life that God intended. It's faithfulness. Faithfulness. And so... Just to get a little more granular, I want to I want to go into like what faithfulness, what serving somebody else looks like. And this example was used, and I really liked it. But if I was, you know, if I was moving and I needed someone to come, people come help me move and carry boxes and all that stuff, and I'm saying, hey guys, thanks for thanks for coming, uh, or thanks for agreeing to come. We're going to meet at my house tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, and we're going to start moving stuff, right? And and Austin's like, awesome, I'll be there. And Austin rolls in about 9.30 the next morning, and he's pounding a donut and some milk, and, and we got some guys there who are carrying in furniture, and Austin, like, grabs a lamp, and he's like, I'll take this in. I don't, I don't carry the big stuff. I don't do that, but I'm going to take this lamp, and I'll grab a few pillows and blankets. Not that this happened. This may have happened. Have this, has this happened? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> hey, not faithful. Not, no, I'm just kidding. That hasn't happened. But... This is, this is what we do. So in that example, who is Austin serving me? I got one no. It's a resounding no. He is, who is Austin serving in this scenario? Himself. Because he gets to convince himself that he is serving someone else when he was serving himself the whole time. He showed up late. He did what he wanted to do. When I how he wanted to do it, when he wanted to do it, here, this is some good revelation for you this morning. When I'm serving, when I'm serving someone else, if I'm serving in a department here in Beyond Church, and there's a coordinator over my department, I'm going to serve when they ask me to serve. I'm going to serve in that kid's class how they ask me to. I don't have the best ideas. I don't, I don't get to decide how we're going to run this class. I'm going to do it how they told me to do it. When they told me to do it, are y'all with me? This is what serving is right here. This is serving. And so you got to ask yourself, in any area of my life, any area of my life where I'm under someone else, am I serving them or am I just serving me? Because if I'm serving me, it's going to show up that you're not really growing in favor with anyone. And I'll tell you what, this stuff is seen right here by the people who are over you, people who are making decisions, people who are watching. You know what they're really looking for, whether they say it or not? They're looking for faithfulness. Faithful. A faithful man? Who can find a faithful man? The Bible says. But people are looking. God's looking for a faithful person. How they need help, when they need help, the way they need help. I'm here to serve. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve you. And in doing so, I know down the road, God may give me a vision of my own that, that other people can serve alongside me, but not until, not until I've been proven in serving other people. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 12. We'll wrap up with this. Luke 12, um, 42 through 48. 
And the Lord replied, a faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, my, the master will put the servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the, the servant thinks my master won't be back for a while and he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk? The master will return unannounced and unexpected and he will cut the servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. And a servant who knows what the master wants but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. Let me read this again. A servant who knows what the master wants but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out the instructions will be punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. You've probably heard this scripture better said like this, with great power comes great responsibility. You know who said that? Uncle Ben from Spider-Man. Is that his name, Uncle Ben? Uncle Ben, laying there, telling him, with great power comes great responsibility. He just ripped off Luke chapter 12 here. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. Somebody who has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Even more will be required. You know the tricky thing about, about coming to church and hearing God's word is that I now become responsible for what I hear. So you didn't know it, but you trapped yourself today in the best way possible. You have an opportunity now with what you've heard to do something with it. You have an opportunity now for reward. The person who didn't hear, yeah, they might not be punished as much because they didn't really know, but now that you know, you're, you're responsible for more, more is required of you, but you have opportunity for reward from the master. Man, that, that's what I'm looking. I want a reward from the master, from him. And, and what a privilege it is to get to learn, to get to hear God's word. Because, again, I don't have to conjure up this strength of somehow doing everything the right way. These men that we read, read about in the Bible, they, they were faithful. They weren't perfect. Faithful does not mean perfect. But faithful is an attitude of the heart. And you better, you better determine, like, what condition my heart is in if I'm being faithful? Am I truly serving them with the right motives? Do I have the right motives? Or am I just looking for that favor and that promotion? See, you don't have to look for something that will come as a result of what you're going to do anyway. It's just going to happen. Don't look for it. You don't have to do it for that. You get to do it with the right heart. And I'm so thankful that because if you're born again. You've got the spirit of the living God living on the inside of you to empower you to live this way. I don't have to do it in my own strength. I've got the spirit of God on the inside of me helping me to walk in and obey what he said. So bottom line, I should feel honored and blessed to know what I know of God's word and of his ways because I can rely on the helper, my helper, to do what he said. You have a helper. One of the Holy Spirit's roles, his main role is called helper. He's there to help you. He's there to help you. All right, last scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. It says, this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Some translations you'll hear the word steward. It's just, it's just this word that means manager. Those, those who have been given something, those who are stewards or managers, they must be proven faithful with what they've been given. So our main goal in this life should be to do whatever he asks when he asks, to do it how he asks, so that we can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, and faithful servant. Let's stand this morning.
That, that should be the goal of our life. This right here, my life here on this earth is a proving ground and giving me an opportunity to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. So we must ask ourselves this question today. Where am I getting my well done from right now? Where, where, where is that in my life that I'm getting my well done from? If it's not from him, then I'm not, I'm not having an opportunity to be faithful in anything. He's the one who gives us well done, my good and faithful servant. So I should be about what he's about. I need to find a way to serve a vision from God that he's put in my life. This is why the local church is so important because God gives the pastor of a local church a vision for there to be impact and for God's kingdom to increase, right? That's a worthy vision to serve. This is why the local church, again, is so important because it's a place where we've got local churches everywhere in this community, in this state, where people can go, they can plug themselves in, they can apply themselves, and they can serve the vision that God's given the leader of that place, and God's kingdom will increase as a result of that. Just how you were reached, you now get the opportunity to be a cog in the machine that reaches somebody else. Amen. The only way that we're going to do that, the only way that my family will truly be a whole family is if we are a faithful family, faithful family, doing what God has called us to do, when he's called us to do it, how he's asked us to do it, faithfulness. Somebody say faithfulness, faithfulness. And before we close today, I want to make sure that everyone's had an opportunity here to make Jesus the Lord of their life. Because without that, without his spirit indwelling you, then you're left on your own to figure out how you can be faithful with the things in your life. It's so much more easier when it becomes a fruit of your spirit that's already in you that you can just yield to on the inside. So much easier. And so every head bowed, every, every eye closed in here, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to repeat a prayer, all of every, every person in here. We're going to repeat a, repeat a prayer because this is good and vital for us if we get an opportunity to lead someone to Jesus in our daily lives. These opportunities should come up. They should come up, and we need to be ready when they do. But if there's anyone in here who hasn't made Jesus the Lord of their life yet, man, I'm telling you what, right now is your time. When we pray this prayer, these aren't just words. These aren't just words. You mix your faith with this. The Bible says that when you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and when you confess him as Lord, he is made Lord over your life and salvation occurs right then. And, and the decision for your eternity is sealed. It's signed, sealed, and delivered. Right then, you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. And so let's pray this together. Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. When I was at my worst, you were at your best. You sent your best. You sent your son to die on the cross for my sins. And he shed his blood for me. Thank you. I confess him as Lord of my life right now, today, and every day going forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. If Jesus is Lord of your life, guess what? He gets to call the shots. He's calling the shots. Let's let him call the shots and let's serve him faithfully in all that we do. Amen. Amen. Well, we love you guys. We're going to dismiss you. You have a great week. Be safe this week. Pastors will be back on Thursday, so we'll uh, get back to it. Uh, no service this Wednesday. We'll get back to it Sunday morning. Y'all have a great week.